Hi, I'm Rob Cosm. Welcome to my shop. If you would work, you glue things together. If you glue things together, you need clamps. I'm going to share with you my top 10 clamping tips. You don't want to miss this. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. We make it our job to help you take your woodworking to the next level. If you're new to our channel, be sure to subscribe, turn on that notification bell, and don't forget to turn on the notification on your mobile device so you'll know every time we release a new video. Good? All right, back to the bench. Knowing how to clamp wood properly is a basic skill for both beginning woodworkers and advanced woodworkers. And there's nothing worse than going through the process of milling the lumber, giving it, getting everything just right, and then something, when the glue's on, goes wrong, and it wrecks the whole glue up. Extremely frustrating, I've had it happen to me. Over the years, I've gained lots of in insight on how to do this properly, how to do it while minimizing those screw-ups, and more importantly, how to figure things out beforehand so that you don't get into that situation. Either way, you got to know how to use clamps properly. There's a good way, there's a bad way, and there's a lot of ways in between. I'm going to share with you mine. You may have heard the saying, you can never have too many clamps. It's quite true. In fact, if you look what I have, and I don't want to even add this up, but uh, the secret was buying just a couple at a time. I've got pipe clamps on the wall. I've got more pipe clamps on the wall over there. I've got this mobile rack that has both sides. And I don't want to know how many thousands of dollars are here, but they're great clamps. I use them all the time, and I have the ability to take the clamp entire rack with me, which is a big plus. So as you get started in this and you're thinking, how am I going to afford all these clamps? Because they're not cheap. In fact, I'll tell you, don't buy the cheap ones. You'll regret it when you go to use them. Buy one or two at a time and just let it accumulate over time. I usually would go out and buy ones that I need specifically for that job, and then that seemed to grow the uh, clamp rack faster than anything else. If you go looking for clamps to buy, you'll find out that there's an awful lot of them. And this is not necessarily a video on what to buy. That'll be the subject of a different video. But what I want to show you is what I typically use. There are heavy duty, medium duty, and what I would call light duty clamps. Now what I've learned over the last 40 years is I've, I've come to rely less and less on the heavy duty clamps. And I've really liked the light duty or the medium duty a whole lot more. And that's probably a lesson in learning to be a little bit better with your woodwork, making sure things fit. Applying more pressure is not always the answer. In fact, rarely is it the answer. So these are light duty, and uh, they don't exert a tremendous amount of force, but they're quick and easy to use. And in applications where I just need enough pressure to hold the two pieces together, they work wonderfully. I'm a huge fan of F-clamps. They come in multiple different sizes. You can get ones that reach way in. You get long ones that are actually replaced the pipe clamps I used to use. What I like about them, if you get the good ones, is that they have multiple surface to grab, so when you adjust them, they grab quickly. They've got a nice solid uh, pad, so it, it minimizes the marking on the piece, and they've got a good grip. The pipe clamps, and there was a time when I used to bend these, I would apply so much pressure on them. I've gotten away from that. In fact, I can't even think of the last time I used pipe clamps, and that's a heavy-duty C-clamp. Still has its application, but... I'm suggesting that you might want to focus more on craftsmanship, get that joint just right so you don't need a ton of pressure to pull it together. Tip number one, and in no order of importance, this is a clamping rack that I made a long time ago. I made it with two pieces of eight foot long plywood. I, uh, I think if I remember correctly, I drilled a series of holes down the middle of the piece and then split it so that I had a little bit of a recess in the exact same spot on both pieces. What this allows you to do is to lay out your clamps prior to your glue up. And if you're gonna do any amount of glue ups on large boards, I highly recommend this. Uh, a good rule to follow is to always have one clamp on the top, next one on the bottom, top, bottom, top, bottom. What you can do in a situation like this is have your bottom ones laid out, have your clamps sized exactly so that they're all in the same spot. You don't wanna to have to chart clamping something together, the glue's drying, and you're finding you're having to adjust it after the fact. Then what you can do, I've got two spaces in between, I'll start with my boards, and then I come in, I can lay the ones on the top to alternate, and that prevents your board from springing, which is the result of too much pressure being pulled on the bottom side. So a clamp rack like this, something you can 
tuck up high out of the way when you're not using it. You can use it for something small or something large, but it comes in really handy. I call it a third hand. Clamping tip number two. Now I've already alluded to this, but it's worth mentioning again. If there's one thing that the new woodworker has a tendency to do wrong when it comes to clamping and glue ups, and sometimes even seasoned woodworkers, it's applying too much pressure. You want enough pressure that you securely hold the two pieces of wood together. You get a little bit of squeeze out so that you know the joint is effectively closed. And one of the reasons why I like these clamps is because it limits the amount of torque you're allowed to apply or can apply. You work with a pipe clamp, you've got quite a bit of leverage on there and you can really bear down on that. Unnecessary. If the joint doesn't fit properly with the amount of pressure you can apply with a small clamp like this, you probably need to revisit how well you made the joint and go back and do that again. Tip number three is clamping pads. Now, I'm not a huge fan of them. I do keep some around. These are the clamping pads that come on the F clamps and you can readily take them off both ends. I prefer this because it's a lot more positive. One of the problems with these is sometimes they have a tendency to slip. However, there are times when I'm working with something that I don't want it to be marred at all, and that's when I put them back on. But I found an even better clamping pad, particularly if you're using something like a pipe clamp, which not only does it apply a lot of pressure, but it also has a tendency, as these move, to pull on the inside. What I mean by that is if you're clamping two boards together like this and you're applying pressure with this clamp, it's going to want to pull that joint in this direction, which is one of the reasons why you have to go top, bottom, top, bottom, meaning running one clamp up here, next one underneath, and back and forth. However, I found something that works really good with that, and it's to take a piece of one inch hardwood dowel, cut it in half. I use a piece of masking tape to put it in place. Anything you can do to make the clamp up easier is well worth it. So I would go on and I would take a piece like this and just clamp it in place, so like I said, so it doesn't move on me. Put another piece in the opposite spot on the other board. Now, the reason I like to use these half round pieces, number one, it's a piece of hardwood, it spreads the pressure over a greater area and it's not going to mar the wood. But the nice thing about it, or the real nice thing is because it's round, the pressure is right out here in the middle and even if your clamp's pulling on the underside, it doesn't matter because that pressure, because of the round and where it's making contact, sends the clamping pressure right down through the middle of the board. And that's your best bet to prevent that thing from either popping up on you or pulling to one side or the other. And I save these, I uh, take them off and keep them in my tool tray and use them again. So clamping pads when you need them. And I think these hardwood one inch dowels do the great job, particularly on long glue ups. Tip number four, if you're clamping up a case or a box, obviously you want the end result to be nice and square, particularly on something you're gonna build drawers for. What you need to make sure is that when you put your clamps on, I prefer to keep them right in the middle of that divider, but you also wanna make sure that that bar is parallel to this horizontal piece. If not, it's going to put uneven pressure. And when I say uneven pressure, what I mean is it's going to pull it one way or the other, and that may very well pull it out of square. When I'm done, I go in, I check my diagonals. If they're not correct, I'll determine which way it needs to go. You can come in with your mallet and just tap each clamp a little bit, and that will be usually enough to tweak it ever so slightly. I'd go back and recheck it and make sure it's square. If it's not, do it again but keeping those parallel almost guarantees you're gonna have a nice square setup when you're done, providing everything else was done properly. Okay, number five, how to find a third hand. When you're gluing up a panel like this, particularly if it's a long one, you've got a lot of glue surface to deal with and you've gotta do it quickly. You don't want that glue to start drying on you. You've applied your glue, now it's a matter of keeping everything lined up. The third hand, is often just a clamp. What I will do is come in, make sure by the way that the pads are nice and clean, put just enough pressure to hold those two pieces flush, come in with your clamp, tighten that up, let that one sit for a minute. Nice to have some really deep clamps because you can then come in 
Go a little bit farther down the line, same thing. Clamp pressure on there, just enough to pull it flush. Come in with your next clamp, apply pressure. And by that time, you can let go of this one. Now, obviously, I'd need another deep one, but just come in here and just work your way down the line, each time using the clamp to hold that nice and flush. Saves you a ton of work in the end and avoids terribly miss out of alignment glued up panels. Hey, if you like this video, we have more. Our monthly newsletter has subscriber only content, discounts monthly on tools, and anything we bring out that's new, subscribers get first crack at it. Click on the link below. Let's get back to work. Okay, tip number six. Now, this involves using something called a call. Let me explain. When you glue a large panel like this, the nice thing about your clamp is that the pressure from the clamp goes out at about a 45 degree angle. That means if this one goes out like that, and this one goes out like that, then that one clamp covers about that much, which means as long as those overlap, this is going to have be all the, all the uh, clamping you're going to need. So wider boards, fewer clamps, because the pressure from the clamp gets spread out. What happens when you try to glue a band on a piece of plywood? You've got a quarter inch band you're trying to glue on here. If that same policy was to be applied, you'd end up having a clamp almost uh, butting each other. You'd have 50 clamps on here. Well, that's not terribly practical. So in a situation like this, what you want to do is introduce what we call a call. By adding this piece of MDF, now you want to make sure that this edge is straight, that the edges of your call are nice and straight, and that this piece has a nice flat surface, both front and back. That way when you're applying the pressure, it's going to be uniform. Now what I can do, and I would use, I wouldn't hesitate to use masking tape to hold these in place, but this one clamp will cover Again, if you go out at about a 45 degree, that will cover all of this. You can go in with your next clamp, and on a board like this, you could easily get away with just three clamps, one in the middle and one on each end. And that's going to give you all the clamping pressure you need. It's gonna have exert nice, even pressure all the way across, and you won't have to worry about gaps between your band and your piece of plywood. Same is true whenever we're gluing up several pieces, uh, for adding veneer to a piece of MDF or a piece of plywood, the more stacks that you can put on top of the veneer, both top and bottom, the fewer clamps you're going to have this way because again, it's going to spread that pressure out at about a 45 degree angle and minimize the number of clamps required. Calls. I had the great fortune of studying under Dale Nish and he was famous for saying the best glue spreader in the world is on the end of your hand. You've got four of them, thumbs a little hard. And what I mean by that is, when I'm applying the glue, I'm gonna put it right in the, first thing you need to know is this. You need to put the glue everywhere you want it before you put the two pieces together. You can't expect that that glue is gonna spread by itself. So if I was going to glue an edge band onto this piece of plywood, I'm going to run the glue bottle right down the middle. I'm gonna use my thumb to help guide my finger, and I will use my finger to help spread that glue evenly. And if I can get it with one shot, I'm that better off, I don't have to come back. Now, if I had some holes in that, I might come back and repair it. But you go in and do that. You don't want too much glue because you don't want it running all down the face like I did right there. And you don't want to starve the joint either, meaning you don't have enough. That's actually a little bit dry. I'd come in and put a little more right there in the middle. Then you can put your band on. Give it some downward pressure so it makes contact before you put your call on and apply your clamps. Not too much glue, but make sure you get enough. Okay, tip number eight. Use a hand plane to get a better glue surface. So I've just run this over the jointer, and this is where most people would stop and they would glue boards together. But I'm gonna take this piece of pencil lid, and if I run it over the board, you'll see what happens. These are all the high points from the scallop marks left by the jointer. So it's not going to give you perfect wood-to-wood -wood contact when you glue another piece done the same way. So instead of that, I like to come in with my hand plane. In fact, you even see how the shaving just takes the tops of those scallops off. 
make a couple of passes to get down through them. Haven't got there yet. You can still see how it's leaving those marks. This one should give you a full, a full shaving. Actually, there's still a little bit, so I'd do one more. Now, when I glue these two pieces together, I'm gonna to get maximum wood-to-wood -wood contact, and I think not only you're gonna get a stronger joint, but the joint's gonna actually disappear because of that so tight fit. Okay, number nine. I like to produce a little bit of a hollow in between the two pieces when I'm gluing up two pieces on their edge. The reason is this. If you put them on top of each other before you glue, and you wiggle one end, if it has a tendency to pivot in the middle, this one's not bad, but it's doing it just a little bit. That means it's touching in the middle, but not touching in the outside edges. And over time, that glue, that joint may possibly start to pull apart slightly right there. So what I would rather do is have just a little bit of a hollow here to keep those ends in nice and tight. So what I would do is first get rid of those marks from the thickness, or from the jointer. I know they're gone when I get a full width shaving. Not quite. And if I can still pivot my plane in the middle, that's not bad. We'll take the second piece and do the same thing. And then we'll check it to see if it actually pivots when we set the two on top of each other. As I've said in other videos, if you continue to plane a long edge, you'll eventually create a convex surface and you don't want that. That's a bump in the middle. Okay, let's check that. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a pivot right here. So what I'm going to do, and it's sometimes easier to follow if you see it like this, I put a line down the middle. So I'm gonna find my midpoint right about here. I'm gonna take a pass. I'm gonna back up and I'm gonna go a little farther forward. I'm gonna back up further, not all the way to the end, and I'm gonna go a little farther forward. I'm gonna come in and take another pass out of the middle. And I'm gonna go almost all the way back and almost all the way forward. One tip here is to always have your plane moving forward as you disengage so you don't end up with a transition mark or a skin tag as I call it. Then I'm gonna take one or two long passes so I don't feel any bump. A Little bit of a bump right there, do that again. Okay, that feels good. I haven't done this one yet, but let's just check it. Okay, so it's pivoting on the outside edges. I'd like to just come in and prepare this a little bit. So what I'll do is the same thing. Take a pass out of the middle, extend it in both directions, almost all the way to almost all the way, and then take one or two long passes. Now there's a little bit of a bump right there, so one more. Now we'll check this. We've got two hand plane surfaces, which means you're gonna have great contact. And when I move it like that, it's touching on the outside edges. That is gonna give me a good glue joint. We'll pull that together and it'll disappear. Number 10, I owe to a good friend, Ahmed. And he may not have invented it, but he convinced me that it actually works. And as a result, I now use this, particularly on narrow bands. And that is to use masking tape. Now I use a particular brand. This is actually called Painters, Automotive Painting, Re, Re, Automotive Painters Tape, I think it's called. It's really strong. So what you do is come right out here in the end, push down or pull down on both sides until that glue spreads a little bit. Get enough of it on there to make good contact. Make sure that the board is centered on your material you're banding, and I would go about every couple of inches, maybe less, depending on how it's working. And you go all the way down. When you're done, 
you haven't had to use up a whole bunch of clamps and calls. Nice thing about uh, the calls are great, but they're a little awkward to deal with. This is a piece of cake. Also allows you to keep your band just barely wider than the piece you're banding, so you don't have so much work to do afterwards. I was, uh, I was amazed at how well this works. I've used it numerous times, but you've got to apply. The secret to it is to make sure that when you're pulling down, hold it there for a second, allow that glue to spread itself out, then clamp it or engage it to the wood and make sure it's good and sticky. There you go. Better clamps, better joints, better woodwork. If you like my work and enjoy my style of teaching, click on any one of these videos and help take your woodworking to the next level. I've always said, better tools make the job so much easier. If you click on the link below, the chisel and plane icon, it'll take you to our site and introduce you to all the tools that we actually manufacture right here in our shop. It'll also give you information on our online and in-person workshops.